Commission. Many thanks. And before we come to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery the Speaker of the Queensland Parliament, the Honourable Fiona Simpson, MP. And we now move to questions to the First Minister. Question one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, later today, I'll be meeting with Marlon Barnes, the Managing Director of the marketing firm Akira, who I'm delighted to announce are creating up to 200 jobs at a new facility in the city of Glasgow. Now, coming after yesterday's positive uh, employment statistics and last week's uh, sparkling performance and in inward investment, and despite a number of challenges in a number of areas and companies, and despite austerity from Westminster, this has been a good news week for the Scottish economy. Yeah. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Could the First Minister tell us, apart from the pound, the Bank of England, the NHS, the armed forces, the monarchy, and the welfare state. What has the United Kingdom ever done for us? Mr. Minister? Well, I, I, I think, is that not more of a question for those who advocate the continuing rule from London over the Scottish people? Uh, I, I would think that having ruled from London and an austerity budget d described by a former Chancellor, I'm just trying to grasp his name, Alistair Darling, <laughs> as madness <laughs> in terms of the economic direction of, of policy, would rather make the case for these economic fiscal decisions over tax and spending being made uh, in Scotland. I also think that many people in Scotland would rather like to be, stay in one of the 190 countries out of 200 in the world who are free of nuclear weapons, as opposed to having the largest concentration of weapons of mass destruction in Europe. John Lemon. It is very odd, then, that the First Minister wants to reassure everybody that everything will stay the same and that nothing will change. Because the mystery is, if the UK has so much we want to share, why would we leave it and then ask them to share the things we've left behind? The truth is, the truth is, and if they're so monstrous, you wonder why they would want to share these things with us anyway. The truth is, his current plan only weakens Scotland. Now his plan is to enshrine a foreign government's economic and welfare policies in Scottish policy without Scots having any say whatsoever. So my, question, so my question to the First Minister is this. He used to say that the pound and the UK welfare state were bad for Scotland. What's changed? First Minister. Well, can I, I just correct uh, Joanne Lambert? Uh, one of the reasons we want to have independence is so we can have social justice for the Scottish people. Exactly. Uh, I noticed that only a few weeks ago, Joanne Lambert said if she could be persuaded of that point, then she would support independence. So let's have a go about persuading her of that point. Uh, one thing that independence will guarantee for the people that they won't have differential rates of benefits across the United Kingdom. I quote from the, the daily record of the 4th of June, a very reliable source indeed. <laughs> Scots could get welfare benefits at lower rates than people in wealthy parts of England under plans being worked on by Labour. Shadow Chancellor Ed Balls yesterday raised the idea of a regional cap in welfare, opening the door to variations in a range of social security benefits. So not just will independence free us from the bedroom tax imposed by the Tory party, it will free us from Ed Balls' plans to pay people in Scotland less benefits than wealthy parts of England. First of all, that's not what Ed Ball said, and he knows it perfectly well. We have all learned that just because the First Minister says it doesn't mean that it is true. And the idea, and the idea 
that it's possible for this government to argue that it will have a greater commitment to social justice under independence when it's already said it will be tied to UK policies and welfare to 2020 is completely ridiculous. And independent experts have said it is impossible to get rid of the bedroom tax day one of independence if you're going to continue with the welfare position as advocated by the UK. It is nonsense on stilts and everyone but this lot know it. But however, presiding <laughs> officers, many of us, maybe all too many of us, remember that young nationalist rogue in Westminster who, when the Tory Chancellor Nigel Lawson announced a cut in corporation tax, was expelled for the Chamber for calling the budget an obscenity. And now, the all-too-rich irony is that the one thing the First Minister wants control of, the one thing he holds firm to, the one thing he won't shift on, is corporation tax. In an independent Scotland, corporation tax would be three pence lower than whatever the Tories set it at. And the benefits? The benefits? He reckons a massive 0.07% growth per year. And that is with 3% margin of error. <laughs> I ask again, what happened to that young man who believed in independence and now advocates independence? First Minister. Uh, Joanne Lavin forgot to mention the thousands of jobs uh, to be created as well. I know that Labour Party these days, the Labour Party these days doesn't care about jobs. And I knew that Joanne Lamont wasn't going to ask about it today, given the splendid jobs figures yesterday. Yeah. But I do think they're still important to some people in this country. And that's why having a competitive rate of corporation tax and then collecting it seems like a good idea. I have been first to criticise George Osborne for his uh, lack of direction in collecting corporation tax uh, in this country. However, it has been pointed out to me that non-payment of corporation tax and other taxes peaked under Gordon Brown's tenure at the Treasury. So I, I really do think Labour, and of course we know the Labour Party are actively advising people on tax avoidance for their own donors at the present moment. So I think they're in a very poor position to lecture people on tax uh, avoidance. But let's get to the guts of the welfare report. What Joanne Lambert misunderstands is the administration of a system doesn't mean an identical policy within the system. We have, for example, at the present moment, a joint administration of the student loan system. Yeah. But there's two radically yeah. different policies in Scotland and England. In Scotland, we have new yeah. old tuition fees thanks to the SNP. In England, they have tuition fees thanks to the Tories and the Labour Party. And do we have more tuition fees in Scotland if in the unlikely event of the Labour Party ever getting back to power? But John Lambert said that I'm misrepresenting Labour policy. I'm quoting the Daily Record. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, if Joanne Lambert has got to the stage that she thinks the Daily Record are secretly trying to undermine Ed Balls and the Labour Party, <laughs> misinterpreting their statements on welfare, then I think that would indicate a sense of, of difficulty within our party which goes even beyond my uh, expectations. The fact is that Ed Balls has accepted the Tory spending plans. He's accepted the Tory cap and welfare. Labour refuse, refuse to say they'll repeal the bedroom tax. And here we have it in the daily record. They want to pay poor people in Scotland less yeah. than poor people elsewhere in these islands. What sort of United Kingdom is that? Joanne Lamont. That's simply not true. <laughs> It's only the First Minister who wants a welfare system which is better and it's going to be funded by cutting corporation tax by three pence more. It's completely ludicrous. It is completely ludicrous. And the fact of the matter, if it wasn't that this was about pensions, people's wages, the future of our children, we could just laugh at that ludicrous response from the First Minister. Well prepared as it was, it did not respond to the challenge at the very heart of his 
his proposals for an independent Scotland, which is to rely on the goodwill of a state that we said oppresses us and we have to free ourselves from. But of course, you see, Deputy Presiding Officer, the question we face is this, and I suspect his own backbenchers and his party members may reflect on this too. Has the First Minister lost his mojo on independence? Or does he simply think, and this might be more accurate, does he simply think the people of Scotland are mugs? Yep. His plans for the currency, for pensions, for benefits and for jobs and mortgages now all hinge on the goodwill of a country we would just have made a foreign one by voting to leave it. They'd, I don't know why you're saying it's rubbish. Your First Minister and your Deputy First Minister have reassured us that that is what would happen <laughs> after independence. Perhaps SNP backbenchers might want to set up a breakaway group, SNP for independence. <laughs> We have a little bit of calm to allow Ms Lamont to complete her question. As we know, the more it noisy is, it's probably the truer the accusation is. Because the truth is, and the First Minister has acknowledged this, indeed he celebrates it, that the UK would control our currency, our economy and now our pensions. But perhaps, perhaps he does have another plan he isn't telling us because it is all too evident that the current plan because it's all too evident that the current plan is neither is neither independence order mr swinney indeed because the fact of the matter is he must have another plan he isn't telling us because the current plan is neither independence nor credible. First Minister. Uh, I was waiting for the big punchline that never came. It was interesting. I got to the fourth question. The fourth question before John Lamont evinced a, a spontaneous reception from the Scottish Conservative Party. Alistair Darling managed a standing ovation. <laughs> I point out, John Lamont, the fundamental misunderstanding. He said it would take goodwill uh, for the government in Westminster to, to accept the, the shared administration of, of the welfare system. Yeah, the point is that Scotland administers a large part of the welfare system of England and Wales. I don't think that's goodwill. That's common sense uh, for the government at Westminster and therefore the proposals put forward by the Welfare Committee. Now, let's turn to the very specific policy, one which I think is as more public currency than any other to talk about the differences between governing in this place and governing from Westminster, and that is the bedroom tax. We know not just from the daily record, <laughs> which Joanne Lamont wants to disassociate herself from now, but also from, uh, uh, from Helen Goodman, who's the shadow cabinet member uh, for Labour and the responsibility of the bedroom tax. And she made it quite clear on the Daily Politics show 11th of March that Labour has no plans to abolish or reverse the bedroom tax. A point exemplified by Ed Balls when he said he would accept the Tories' entire spending plans only this week. In contrast, in contrast, this government will abolish the bedroom tax if we are elected as the first government of an independent Scotland. And not only will we abolish it, we'll do it in the first year of that independent Scotland. The presiding officer, uh, to ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Okay, no plans near future. Ruth Davidson. This morning, the Health Secretary, Alex Neil promised that people who'd been forced to pay thousands of pounds in care costs for relatives with complex care needs that should have been covered by the NHS would be appropriately reimbursed. In three years, we've seen the number of people having these care costs supported fall by 27% across Scotland. 
So can I ask the First Minister, why have relatives of some of the most vulnerable and desperately ill people in this country been denied the support to which they were entitled? First Minister. Well, the, the guidelines in terms of continuing care in, in Scotland have been consistent for some time. The updated guidance was issued in 2008. It took it out of the good practice recommendations which were uh, put forward by the Scottish Public Service uh, Ombudsman. Uh, and what the Health Secretary said, and what I'll repeat, is if any case in which these guidelines haven't been followed, uh, then of course that situation will be rectified. Luckily, because of the passage of the Patient Rights Act, the Patient Advice and Support Services, which is operated by the Scottish Citizens Advice Bureau, the Care Information Scotland line funded by the Scottish Government with a confidential phone line, and access to the health board itself means there are many routes for patients to look and to challenge a position that they think is unjust. But can I just say to, to Ruth Davidson, yes, of course, if any individual has not had their rights according to the regulations in Scotland, then that case will be looked at and rectified. But I would much rather live in a country where 77,000 people at the present moment have access to free personal and nursing care and are cared for as part of the fabric of the health service than in a country which does not have that advantage for its elderly people. Yeah. Ruth Davidson. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm sure that the First Minister isn't conflating continuing health care entitlement with free personal care on purpose, knowing as he does that they are separate and we're not talking about free personal care here. We are talking about the continuous uh, health care entitlement. And I, I, I'm pleased that the First Minister has acknowledged that the Health Minister held his hands up to the problem today. He did, and I believe that that's a start, and I thank Alec Neil for that. But at one point in his BBC interview, he said that he thought it was only a small number of people affected, and then at another he said he thought we were talking about, and I quote, a few thousand in total. So the truth is surely that nobody knows how many people have been affected by this. And when the Health Minister and the First Minister ask for those affected to come to them, I say that the government needs to be a bit more proactive than that. This First Minister has a responsibility to find out how many people in Scotland caring for critically ill relatives have been handing over thousands of pounds when they shouldn't have been. We need a full audit of every person in every health board who may be affected either currently or historically in order to ensure that proper reparations are paid. Will the First Minister order one? First Minister. Uh, can I just, because it's a serious subject for people, so can I just take Ruth Davidson through what actually happens at the present moment? Uh, the guidance, as I mentioned in my first answer, was updated in 2008, and that took account of the recommendations of good practice from the Ombudsman. What happens to people is that the consultant or general practitioner, in consultation with a multidisciplinary team, will decide whether an individual is eligible for NHS continuing health care. Uh, and that guidance states that the person that takes the lead is down to the complexity, nature and intensity of somebody's health needs. People are assessed within the system at the present moment. Secondly, thank goodness for this. Under the Patient Rights Act, far from sitting back and, and not doing anything about the rights of patients, we passed the, citizen, the Patients' Rights Act of 2012 and instituted two additional means of people making sure that the health service is treating them properly and according to the guidance. The Patient Advice and Support Service for the Citizens Advice Bureau uh, and, and also the Care Information Scotland, which is funded by the Scottish Government, which provides that confidential care line. These are avenues by which people can get the rights and entitlement under the National Health Service. But Ruth Davison's sweeping away of the importance of the 77,000 people who get, who get free personal nursing sweeping care away, yes. is not... It's not is exactly on this subject. What happens to people who are entitled to continuing care within the health service is that the people and three quarters of people almost are in hospital who are in this position and therefore have no accommodation charges in that sense, but get help with accommodation charges in nursing homes in a way that pre-personal and nursing care doesn't. That is the aspect of the system and the system is a continuous one. And therefore, what needs to be done and will be done, and certainly will be done, is that we'll ensure that the regulations are properly followed, that the opportunities for patients and uh, individuals and elderly patients and their relatives to come forward on these means, if there's anything that has been done contrary to these regulations, then it will be rectified. But not to understand that a system 
of free personal nursing care in a society is fundamentally to superior to where it doesn't exist, I think it's not to understand the importance of defending that system for the Scottish people. Many thanks. Constituency question from Neil Finlay. Let me tell you, First Minister, it's uh, not been a good or sparkling week for employment in my area. So can I ask the First Minister what help can be given to the people in my region now that Wiseman Dairies have entered consultation over 116 job losses at their Whitburn depot? This in an area already reeling from the loss of 1,700 job losses at Halls of Broxburn. First Minister. The, the sparkling performance, of course, was in relation to inward investment, and the Labour Party should accept that the employment figures, particularly for young people uh, in Scotland, were very, very good news uh, indeed. In putting forward a constituency issue, which is a very important one, uh, then what the members should know uh, is that the Scottish Enterprise officials have already been in touch with the company. The National Pace Minister spoke yesterday with the company's uh, HR representatives to offer support for any employees who might be affected by redundancy. The companies say that no decisions have been taken. They also point to the increase in posts which could be created at other distribution centres. But the members should understand that we take these matters very seriously. And there will be both pace and ministerial intervention, as indeed there has been substantial intervention in West Lothian to try and secure the employment and employment prospects of his constituents. That is something we should jointly do as a parliament, just as we should jointly welcome the substantial indications that the Scottish employment situation is improving and that youth unemployment in particular has shown remarkable progress over the last 18 months. Many thanks. Question three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. In the next meeting of the Cabinet will discuss issues of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. When I asked before about divisions at the police, he laughed and said it was creative tension. Was he laughing when the Chief Executive resigned in February? He told me that matters had been resolved, but now we discovered that chaos continued at the heart of our newly centralised police force. Why didn't he tell this Parliament about the resignation of this senior public leader? I have to say, this stinks of a cover-up. Why was this Parliament not informed of the resignation of the authorities Chief Executive? Just what did he have to hide? First Minister. Well, can I quote uh, Vic Emery, the chair of the Scottish Police Authority uh, today? He says there's continuity at the top of the Scottish Police Authority. Strategic direction and decision making continues to be provided by a board of 13 members. We have all been appointed for a four year term. Continuity is strong at board level. The organisation is maturing its relationship with both Police Scotland and other stakeholders. He also points out it's been before the Parliament on a number of occasions. I don't think Willie Rennie should conflate uh, uh, the uh, interim uh, appointments with the permanency of the Scottish Police Authority. And I think you should take the word of the Chairman of the Police Authority, who says that these matters are in hand and the organisation looks confidently to the future. The other thing I'd say to Willie Rennie is that uh, when we look at the uh, spectacular success of the Scottish Police Service, in delivering the lowest rate of recorded crime for a generation, if we look at the excellence of its performance uh, across Scotland, then I really think a party forecasting doom and disaster when all of the justice figures and the effectiveness of the police in Scotland say otherwise is basically going to be on a hiding to nothing yes. as these points and arguments are replayed to them in the months to come. Yes. Well, Rennie. You cannot hide behind operational independence on this. The Scottish Government, as Andrea Quinn's letter points out, have been involved every step of the way on the organisation, on the structure of the new Scottish Police Authority. The Chief Executive was going, but it was kept quiet. And as a result, as a result we will be without a permanent Chief, and we've had three Chief Executives in just one year. If that's continuity, I don't know what not continuity is. Why wasn't the recruitment process started earlier? The First Minister told me that the chaos was sorted in January. Then she resigned in February. We led a police debate in March, but Parliament was not told. Did the Government ask the Chairman to keep the organisation, the resignation, quiet to avoid embarrassment? So, very precisely, did your Government tell Vic Emery to keep this quiet. 
First Minister. Uh, I have no, well, I'm not hiding my operational independence, but uh, certainly I have no knowledge of anyone in the government suggesting any such thing to Vic Emery. Vic Emery says not because in his statement today he says, he says that changes in personnel are a feature of most mergers and reform uh, programmes. But you know, the issue of uh, operational independence is actually not something to hide behind, it's something of fundamental importance. The operational independence of the police service is of huge importance in a democratic society and by definition even more important that the Scottish Police Authority has to have operational independence. But you know, Vic Emery points out in his quote today, by the end of this month he'll have appeared before the Justice Committee on four occasions. Then there'll be ample opportunity for Willie Rennie to put any conspiracy theory that comes into his head to the Justice Committee. That's assuming he remembers to turn up this time. Many thanks. Question four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government has been in contact with the UK Government regarding illegal surveillance activities in Scotland. First Minister. We are clear that people have the right to communicate without the fear of unlawful surveillance by the state. And following the extensive media coverage of GCHQ's access to US, and US intelligence, Scottish ministers have sought assurances from the UK government. The Cabinet Secretary for Justice wrote to the Foreign Secretary on Tuesday of this week, both to acknowledge the statement which was made by Mr Haig on Monday, but to ask for further information for the benefit of this parliament. I thank the First Minister for his answer. Um, can I ask if the reply also from Mr Haig will itself be published? However, what is the current oversight system for surveillance in Scotland? And has there been any consideration of changes to the system in the future? Minister. Well, I, I refer in terms of the future work to the, the evidence that the uh, Deputy First Minister gave before uh, uh, the relevant uh, committee. But can I just share with Christy Graham the, the points that the, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice made to the Foreign Secretary? Uh, Kenny McCaskill said, you'll appreciate as Cabinet Secretary for Justice, I wish to be satisfied the rights of people in Scotland have been upheld. In addition, I expect there will be a Scottish parliamentary interest in this matter. And I would therefore be grateful for further information from you about the approach you are taking to this investigation and the progress that is being made to provide the necessary assurance in relation to compliance with the law. So in straight answer to, to Christine Graham's question, and of course, that reply will be published and we would expect, although it's a matter for the relevant parliamentary committee, uh, that the parliamentary committee, of course, uh, could question on that evidence and further pursue the matter if they choose. Thank you. Question five, Jackie Bailey. Minister, what steps the Scottish Government is taking to improve the detection of cervical cancer? First Minister. Well, the, the earlier a uh, cancer is detected, the easier it is to treat. And we know that the screening is the best way to detect cervical cancer at its earliest stage. Every woman in Scotland between 20 and 6 years of age is invited to be screened for cervical cancer every three years. Information leaflets which are issued with each invitation contain information on the symptoms and advice in seeking medical advice if the symptoms are present. This week, of course, is Cervical Screening Awareness Week. And the message from this government, and I'm sure from this whole chamber, is that all eligible women in Scotland should find out more about cervical screening so they can be informed as possible about the benefits of such screening. Thank you, Bailey. Um, can I absolutely associate myself with the First Minister's response? Early detection is, of course, extremely important. But does he not also agree that securing swift follow-up treatment is also key? Unlike England, the Scottish Government only has cancer waiting targets for initial treatment, but when it comes to follow-up treatment, there is some evidence that suggests that patients are waiting longer to be seen, but this is not recorded. Does the First Minister therefore believe that this hidden cancer waiting list is acceptable? First Minister. Well, I, I, I was hoping that on this issue, given its importance and given this is Cervical Cancer Week, that the Chamber could speak with one voice and Jackie Bailey could avoid seeing every single issue uh, as a potential issue for political division in a service which should unite this whole Chamber. Yeah. As Jackie Bailey should know, the Early Detect Cancer Programme, yeah. uh, which augs at some cancer, is we're considering the future inclusion of additional tumour groups. There are excellent results in terms of the uh, cancer and treatment waiting times, as Jackie Bailey also knows. Those. And for goodness sake, just for once, let's unite in seeing the importance of this condition and supporting the efforts of those who are putting it forward. Thank you. Question six, Alex Johnston. To ask the First Minister how much it would cost annually for an independent Scotland to raise benefit payments to a level that the Scottish Government considers appropriate. First Minister. 
Well, as Alec Johnson should know, we've made two specific commitments about changes that we think are necessary in the context of an independent Scotland when this chamber and this parliament gains control over Social Security. But I do think we should reflect on the changes we've already had to make as a result of the imposition of some of these welfare changes from Westminster. Uh, the attempt to cut council tax benefit by 10%, yep. which would have affected 560,000 people across Scotland, his constituents, my constituents, luckily avoided by the joint action of COSLA and this government uh, in terms of making up that amount. That cost £40 million. The £33 million now into the Social Welfare Fund to boost the emergency a loan fund as a result of the impact of the welfare changes being imposed from Westminster and of course the additional £8 million going to the advice agencies so that people suffering from the policies being imposed by his colleagues at Westminster can get the help and advice they need. These are points in mitigation. But the two policies we've already announced for an independent Scotland uh, will also offer fairness and justice to the people of Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Alex Johnson. I note the, minister, the First Minister's careful answer, but still it does not account for the fact that members of his front bench team, and particularly his backbenchers, are making promises to many people in Scotland about what would apparently happen to benefits and welfare should Scotland become independent. It is absolutely essential that the First Minister take the opportunity to lay out which of these promises he intends to keep which he believes are merely on-the-hoof commitments, and what the cost will be. Because if this cost is substantial, the additional transfer of wealth required within the Scottish economy is something that everyone should be aware of before they vote on independence. Will the First Minister give that commitment to make these figures public? Oh, First yes, Minister. I, I give the commitment to, to welfare and equity and justice is going to be one of the key arguments in this independence yeah. campaign. Yeah. The, cost, the cost of the commitments that we've made in terms of abolishing the bedroom tax will be £68 million a year. Moving away from the earnings disregard and giving parity and justice uh, to women in Scotland will cost in the region of £60 to £80 million a year. We've made these commitments already. But can I say to Alec Johnston that looking at this argument, the imposition of deep unfairness in terms of the Westminster Government's attitude to these things, the plunging of tens of thousands of more people in Scotland into relative poverty, reversing, I believe, as these changes will do, the progress that's been made in child poverty in Scotland, of all the flimsy basis on which the Union and the alliance with the Labour Party will stand, that is the flimsiest of them all. And people who vote for independence will vote for social justice and progress yeah. in that Scotland. Thank you. And that concludes questions to the First Minister. Last week I asked a question about the inappropriate payment of senior staff at the State Hospital. Last week the First Minister told me that on the terms of the conditions of the Scottish Pay Reference and Implementation Group in June 2005 and the terms and conditions for State Hospital senior managers in October 2006, I was wrong and everything was fine. He believed it was acceptable for senior managers to pay themselves as much as £7,000 each in back pay whilst the pay of frontline staff was frozen. Last, year I was, uh, last week, sorry, I was order, clear, please. indeed I'm just coming to it, that there is nothing in either document that allow for such payments and in any event these need to be signed off by the Cabinet Secretary, not by the Chair or the Chief Executive of the Health Board, something that has patently not happened. That, Presiding Officer, was the position last week. This week, of course, the position has changed. There is now the case that the Chief Executive has been moved. There is an internal inquiry, not just about bullying, but also about the shortcomings about procedures and governance processes. I published a letter from Gordon Craig today, which is clear about the inappropriate nature of the payments. Can we get to the so, point? presiding officer, I would be grateful to know whether it is in order for the First Minister last week to perhaps unknowingly mislead Parliament, or was it the case that he was misled by his own Cabinet Secretary for Health? And can you invite him to amend the official report to correct his evident error? Thank you.
As presiding officers have said in the past, we are not responsible for the veracity of what is said in the chamber. The content of the First Minister's responses to questions are matters for the ministerial code, and this is therefore not a point of order, as Ms Bailey, I'm sure, is well aware. Margaret MacDonald, point of order. Presiding officer, I, I apologise for bringing up such a minor matter, but is Mojo a parliamentary... <laughs> As you said, Ms MacDonald, that is a minor matter and not a point of order. Thank you. And before we move to the next item of business and for the information of members not atten intending to participate in members' business, the AGM of the CPA Scotland branch is due to get underway at 12.45 in committee room two, and I would encourage all members to attend. <laughs>